Good evening, I'm Mac Barrett, Curator of Public Programming at Roosevelt House, and on behalf of Hunter College President Jennifer Rabb and Roosevelt House Director Harold Holzer, it's my pleasure to welcome you to a virtual discussion of one of the most challenging and complicated policy issues of our time, data security. To do so, I'm pleased to welcome Daniel Solov and Woodrow Hartzog, two of the world's leading experts on privacy and data security, and the co-authors of Breached, Why Data Security Law Fails and How to Improve It. In Breached, Solov and Hartzog deliver a fresh assessment of the factors that contribute to the insecurity of our private data. By looking at a series of stories about major data breaches, the authors reveal how such breaches might have been mitigated or prevented and provide a bold and holistic new vision for data security law. Daniel Solov is the John Marshall Harlan Research Professor of Law at George Washington University Law School. He is also the founder of Teach Privacy, a company that provides privacy and data security training programs to businesses, law firms, healthcare institutions, and schools. He is the author of Understanding Privacy, The Digital Person, Technology and Privacy in the Information Age, and Nothing to Hide, the False Trade-Off Between Privacy and Security. Woodrow Hartzog is a professor of law and computer science at Northeastern University Law School and Curry College of Computer Sciences. His research has appeared in the Yale Law Journal, Columbia Law Review, California Law Review, The Guardian, Wired, Slate, The Atlantic, and The Nation. He is the author of Privacy's Blueprint, The Battle to Control the Design of New Technologies. And to speak with Daniel and Woodrow, I'm pleased to also welcome security technologist Bruce Schneier, a graduate of Hunter College High School from the class of 1981. Bruce's books include Click Here to Kill Everybody, Security and Survival in a Hyperconnected World, and Data and Goliath, The Hidden Battles to Collect Your Data and Control Your World. He publishes the newsletter Cryptogram and the blog Schneier on Security. Daniel, Woodrow, Bruce, thank you so much for joining us to discuss this critical topic. Before we begin, please remember to ask your questions using the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom screen at any time during the program, and we will address as many as time allows at the end. Also, please look for a link to purchase Breached in the chat. With that, please welcome Daniel Solov, Woodrow Hartzog, in conversation with Bruce Schneier. Hey there, everyone. Uh, thanks for being there. Uh, talking about data and privacy, I'm kind of amazed that they pulled my high school out of some data somewhere. I mean, I don't know. You guys get to be university uh, professors. I get to graduate high school. That's right. So uh, we've all been doing this uh, for a while. I mean, Dan and I have known each other for, for decades. Uh, Woody, I don't have known, not known you as long. I think the difference is that uh, you're approaching this really from a legal perspective, and I approach it from a tech perspective. Although, to be fair, Woody is also a computer science professor, so we got some overlap there. And what I really want to talk about is, is the policy. And we spent a lot of time on the tech, and what I like about the kind of things you write is that it focuses on what the policy solutions are. And I mean, I, I have my own opinion, but I want to ask whoever wants to answer, why do you think we focus on the tech and not the policy? Well, I think we've been, um, well, first, I just want to say, I mean, it's really an honor to be uh, talking to you about this topic. Um, I, I love your blog. I love your books, everything you- And I graduated from high school at Hunter. Yeah. Everything you've written has been incredibly insightful and has uh, just been so useful to shape my thinking about the issue. And uh, one of the things I, I think that, you know, I think law is, is struggling with is, is that um, it's, you know, newer to the game than technologists have been. Um, technologists have been grappling with this issue uh, and the law really starts coming around uh, after um, the first data breach notification in 2005 with ChoicePoint. Uh, and that's where we really see this, this big, massive amount of law being passed to address the, the data breach problem because you know data breaches existed long before ChoicePoint, long before 2005, uh, but the law in California that was passed in 2003 
mandated that the breaches be disclosed and other states have followed suit. The breach notifications have spread to all 50 states. Now they're around the world. Uh, so we're hearing a lot more about breaches and, and that has made legislators kick in to try to address the problem. And I think uh, in, in ways that I, I, I think are not fully um, uh, wise to um, the most effective ways to protect security. And, and I'll just jump in a little too. Bruce, I want to reiterate Dan's thanks uh, for joining us today. It's really a pleasure. And um, Click Here to Kill Everybody this was one of the books that we re really dove into a lot as we wrote uh, our own book. Um, and I think there are two other things that may be happening here, one of which is, um, as you know, from spending so much time making seemingly really complex technological things accessible to people. Sometimes it can be bewildering when you look into the sort of belly of the beast, right? People talk about zero day exploits and all of these other things that um, to a lot of people seem really complex. And I think that there may be a tendency um, because it is so complex for the law to sort of um, sometimes step off a little, right, and say, listen, you know, you y'all seem to know what's happening here. So maybe just sort of fix it, you know, generally and broadly. And then that also leads to the other thing that may be happening here, which is that uh, there is a general sort of movement for technological solutionism uh, with a lot of the problems that we're seeing, which is, you know, let's use technology to fix it. Um, and of course, technology is, an, is a major part of the story, um, but I don't think that the law has done a really great job of sort of working um, with technologists and sort of thinking about the sort of superstructure about what, you know, what are the proper technological interventions versus what are the rules we just need to enforce better? Um, or what are the sort of general policy things outside of the technological wizardry and the, you know, five seconds, a lot of what's depicted in pop culture where people just, you know, type for five seconds on a computer and say, I've solved it. Um, some of the harder questions, some of the harder trade-offs that we get into with policy. And so and Dan uh, mentioned uh, Choice Point uh, 2005 as the start of, of sort of regulation. That was 17 years ago. Right. So if that was the impetus, we kind of haven't seen anything yet, which I think is interesting. And neither of you have uh, pointed to uh, lobbying. I would maintain that the reason we don't have actual privacy law is that the money doesn't want it. That the, well, the money, money yeah. is perfectly happy to uh, be taking our data and have no regulation. Yeah. The, yeah, the money, the money doesn't want any regulation and it, it typically, you know, the, there was a pushback against even notification because the, it's much cheaper and better in the regime where all the breaches were just dirt swept under the rug and no one knew about them. Um, the response legislatively, legislatively has been predominantly to be this first move, which is actually a good move, but it's just not enough, which is let's shine the light. Let's look under this rock and see what's going on. And when you look, shine the light and see all the breaches, we see, wow, we really have this really bad problem. And uh, what the law often does is, uh, you know, it, it actually can be somewhat effective in, in shining a little bit of light and in typically, you know, pushing a little bit of transparency. Uh, but then when it really gets hard, which is the next step of, okay, well, now what do we do? Is there something that we can do to help the problem? That's where the law somewhat shies away. And the typical legal responses are, to, are often reactionary um, punches and jabs after something bad has happened. Uh, well, something bad has happened, so let's have lawsuits and let's have regulators pounce on companies that have breaches. But they're often not really like, how do we really fully understand what's going on here and how do we really solve it? Um, you know, law tends to just say, okay, we're going to shine a light. And then when we see something we don't like, we're going to try to whack it. Um, that's how the law works in a lot of areas. I just think it's not, you know, going to solve this problem that way. Yeah, absolutely. And Bruce, you did, you, you raise a great point when you say companies are 
uh, are fine with any solution that allows them to keep on sucking up people's data. And I think that one of the major issues that we saw getting into this, and one of the arguments that we make in the book, is that lawmakers have conceived of data security very sort of narrowly and atomistically. They say, tell people if you've been breached, and it all is centered around this idea of the breach, right? Tell people you've been breached and build a bigger wall or a better wall to keep the bad guys out, right? And that's essentially it. And notice that that doesn't interfere with a lot of companies' business models, right? Because they're probably going to do a lot of those things anyway. But one of the things we know about data security that would really actually improve data security are really good privacy laws. Having a really robust data minimization regime that allows for less data to get collected in the first place because information that doesn't get collected can't be breached. But that that's a more structural um, uh, intervention that's really going to mess with a lot of companies' bottom lines. And so I think that it's in their incentive to make to to conceive of data security relatively narrowly, and then say, "Listen, we've done all that we can do, right? We we said have safeguards, have breach notification. You know, what else do you want from us? Conveniently it, ignoring. Yeah, it's going to be hard to mess with surveillance capitalism. It's interesting <laughs> when I think about breaches and, and remedies. It's easier. I mean, I have to show a financial loss, right? So if uh, you breach my financial information and there's fraud and I can actually connect this fraud to this breach, which is actually really hard, I can sue for damages. But if you steal my health information, if you steal, uh, I don't know, my, my personal correspondence, if you steal uh, embarrassing photos of me and publish those, it's much harder for me to prove harm. The focus is on financial harm. And I, I, how do we deal with that? That seems like a huge issue and something we really need to get, get beyond. Well, I think privacy law is way too, and, and security law too, is way too fixated on harm. And I think that harm is really essentially a, uh, it, it's almost been weaponized by courts that don't want to really address the problem and, and want to even undermine laws that deal with the problem. So we have these cases and privacy from the Supreme Court that have basically held that even if a statute has a private right of action, remedying a clear violation of the law, such as labeling a person a terrorist based on a name match, which is just totally uh, a, a, an awful practice that no one could argue is justifiable, that is just a clear violation of the law. The Supreme Court says, well, there's no standing. You can't even bring a case, even though the law provides for a private right of action because there's no harm because it wasn't disclosed to anyone, which I think is just absolutely absurd, ridiculous to the point of being outrageous. So, um, but courts will almost go out of their way to say there's no harm. And especially when it comes to a data breach where, um, most of the hackers are not caught and we don't know what they've actually done or might do in the future. Um, uh, it's very hard to trace everything to a particular breach uh, unless it happens right after the breach and a lot of work to, to actually link it up. And, and uh, so uh, this becomes a, a, a source or a way to, to, for courts just to dismiss cases. Uh, and and then harm really, I think, is this this weapon that that weeds out a lot of you know very you know good cases where there's clear wrongdoing. Because in a lot of these breach cases, they don't even get to the issue of you know was something bad done, was a company irresponsible, was the data secured, and a lot of times data security is terrible, and 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 the things that were done are awful. But yet you know courts will say, well, that doesn't matter because there's no harm. Uh, and we, this happens again and again, and, and that's, I think, a big problem. And, and I think uh, either we need to reconceptualize what harm means. I think courts need a much better, richer understanding of harm because harm is, it's not, you, know, you don't look for someone bleeding um, and actually wounded. Harm is about risk and security is about risk. It's about increased risk. Uh, and and in other areas, there are tools to understand risk. We, we can 
understand it, we can calculate it, we can address it, we can deal with it. It's actually something we can work with and, and understand. Courts seemingly get risk and, and, and they can't see it. It's like a ghost to them and they can't seem to conceptualize that risk has any weight or import, uh, which is surprising in our modern age when we have a much more sophisticated understanding of risk. Courts seem to just not get it. Uh, maybe they don't want to get it. Uh, anyway, I, I think that you know, you know, harm might not necessarily be the best thing even that we should be looking at um, when it comes to this, uh, because I think that the concept does so much mischief. Yeah, I, I completely agree with that. And, and in the book, we talk a little bit about the need to shift away from thinking about this as uh, you know, company doing X security practice, which directly leads to a harm to an individual, because A, you're right, that's incredibly hard to prove. B, we also know that uh, a breach of my personal data can be used in a phishing email to someone else, right? So the harm isn't felt by me, but rather facilitates, you know, a harm that's 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 impacted somewhere else, and that doesn't sort of make it any less dangerous in the aggregate. So thinking about risk, thinking about aggregation is another one. But as an example, like moving away from just this entire individualized policy response, and we propose in the book to look at things like public health frameworks which are actually meant to be much more structural or um, maybe more directly, you can think anyone that's had to uh, have a, a house up to code, right? Building codes for houses or um, uh, food safety laws, right? So we, we uh, don't wait until a restaurant has such, bad, such a bad environment for serving food that they accidentally poison one of their customers, we have a series of checks where someone comes in and says, listen, that's a health code violation that could lead to harm. And it doesn't matter whether someone actually got sick or not, it's still a legal violation. And we need to, I think, adopt that kind of mindset to, to, to address risk sort of structurally, rather than thinking, you know, drawing a line from A to B on harm. So I want to actually highlight two things that were said. I think it was interesting. The first is the stepping stone idea that if your privacy is breached, no one might care about you. It might be because your email is useful to get to the CEO and that's how we're stealing some money. I think that's a really interesting point that is left out of the debate. And uh, I think the public health model is really interesting, right? We don't go after restaurants that have successfully poisoned their customers and give them gargantuan fines, right? That's not the methodology we use. We have a system of health inspectors that inspect all restaurants and, and assume they are up to some, some safety code. And I know we're going to get back to that because that, I think, is a really interesting uh, a way of thinking about privacy. I want to ask you a question. In, in other areas where it is trouble, we have trouble figuring out which particular bad thing led to the outcome, we have something called statutory damages. So if I download a Disney movie illegally, Disney... Uh, can find me, well, I guess the courts can find me $10,000. Disney does not have to prove harm. They don't have to prove that I released it, that I watched it, that I showed it to people, that I shared it. Statutory damage is $10,000. Would that work here where we, we get rid of harm completely and just say for privacy breaches of personal information, there's a statutory damage of X per record? I think that could work um, partially. Um, so I definitely That's think, why I like you lawyers. Yeah. So it's definitely better than the current system. And it's better because a, a lot of courts, well, the, the problem is that the Supreme Court's done a lot of mischief to statutory damage provisions. So there is a statutory damage provision in the Privacy Act. And it says the minimum damages, you know, that someone should be able to get are a thousand dollars. The Supreme Court has read it and say, no, you actually have to prove actual damages. Now, I read this provision. I don't see it. Uh, the court somehow does all sorts of uh, mental gymnastics to try to interpret uh, an actual damage requirement into a statute that has a statutory damage requirement. And the standing requirements also are ones that will um, override a statutory award of damages. So the courts can say, well, there's no harm. Uh, and therefore, even though you have a private right of action with statutory damages, you can't get into court. Um, so 
you know, there's, there's mischief being done by the courts that don't seem to get it, and they actually undermine statutes that have this. But even if we had fixed, if we fix all this, we have more statutes with the with, with statutory damages, and we get the courts to go along with it and not you know resist it and have a, a temper tantrum over it, then um, there's still the problem is that you know adding more financial penalties on top of breaches is a kind of just marginally increasing the pain on the organization that had the breach and. You know, they could have done better. In almost all cases, you look at the organization of the breach and you find they did something stupid um, and they could be better. But at the end of the day, there's so much more. They're already going to pay a lot of money. Breaches are already going to be really costly. Breaches are already really painful. So adding, ratcheting up the pain from like an eight to a nine or a nine to a 10 is only going to get you some marginal benefit. And, and I think the law needs to look at that there are other players in the mix that we need to address to really make more of a dent in the problem because I think, you know, yeah, we, we can clean up all the uh, mistakes that organizations might make and that'll help, but, you know, there's only going to be so much we're going to be able to do because, you know, as much as you, you know, you know, heap them in damages, there's just so much they're going to be able to train, you know, a 50,000 person workforce in, you know, spotting phishing emails. I mean, yeah, they, they, they can do better, but, you know, it, it's going to be really hard to imagine they're going to be perfect with it. Yeah, but that, I think that's a red herring. I mean, yes, there are lots of phishing emails that always get through. The problem is not the employee who's overworked and harried and or makes a mistake. The problem is the system by which a phishing email can be so destructive, right, that, that, it, that my credential can be used to siphon money or, or siphon records. I, I, I always think that blame the victim mentality is, is, is very much a mistake. It, it's the design of the system that puts the person in that situation where if they mistakenly click on a link, everything goes bad. I mean, it's a link. What are we supposed to do with them? We're supposed to click on them. And if they are unsafe, that is the system's design. If I can't plug a strange USB stick into my computer, that's not my fault. It's a USB stick. That's what they're for. It's the system's fault that allows a strange USB stick to do damage. So I, I, I totally want to agree. Be careful about that kind of victim blaming. I totally agree. I think I think we you know we we blame the victim and and you know it's really hard to tell you know what you should do with email. I mean, one thing that that's frustrating is you know uh, companies will send legitimate companies send emails that we try to train people are phishing emails. So I just got one the other day from. Uh, you know, Google that was like, please lo load up this document, click this button, and you can load it up. And I'm like, how, oh, how can I tell if this is legit or not? It, it, I think it was legit. Um, but um, I, I don't click the button, I go directly to the site. But I see this happen all over again, the companies just think, well, we'll, we'll keep sending out these emails, but somehow we expect people that, that but then we'll turn around and tell people don't click. Uh, but then we'll send them emails to show that legitimate companies do this. So which is it? Legitimate companies either do it or they don't do it. But if they do it, then they're undermining all the training. We're trying to tell people what, what they should and shouldn't do. Yeah, and I, I completely agree, Bruce. And, and we've got a bit uh, in the book about that as well, about how if you only look at the, the sort of last link in the chain right before the breach, it's easy to be like, oh, you shouldn't have clicked on the link. You shouldn't have done the USB thing. But there was, there's a whole, it's like an iceberg. Like there's a whole ocean of stuff like underneath it, right? There's this massive um, thing that you don't see that's underneath the water that really sets up a lot of the failure. And to, to go back to your point about statutory damages, one of the things that I'd like to see in addition to sort of spreading out the um, accountability so that it's not just that one entity that is that ultimately becomes liable, um, I'd also like to see some specific interventions around the design of these information systems. Um, I think that we've started on that a little bit, and the Federal Trade Commission um, has started to sort of push into thinking about ways in which companies need to, to design um, not just the, the back end, the hard drive segmenting servers, firewalls, and all of that, but the front end as well um, to help people make good decisions and, and um, to, to make sure that signals are made apparent to people. And um, 
that can be done through specific rulemaking. It can be done through, you know, slowly through FTC complaints. But I'd like to see a focus on that. And I think that would help, even if we only wind up with injunctions and audits and fines for failure to, you know, comply. Um, that gets us out of the whole, um, you know, how much emotional harm did you suffer because of the breach? Because sometimes it's major, sometimes it's like a paper cut and it's not worth going and, and it moves us more towards a, a uh, beforehand, right? So getting the system right to uh, accommodate risk rather than letting people build bad systems and then, you know, wagging our finger after the fact. So I got, there's a lot of this conversation going in many directions. I want to focus on a few things to start. I and mean, when we think about uh, punishment, right? I mean, the whole point is deterrence, right? So uh, murder, uh, robbery, any kind of sort of person-to-person -person crime, uh, we punish the guilty. And so we go after the bad actor. The, the person who, who shot the other person, we're going to arrest, we're going to arrest him. And the goal is, is, is to have some back channel to disincent future criminal behavior, right? So if a criminal knows that, or someone knows that if they rob a store, they'll get arrested and put in jail, they're less likely to do the thing. And so that's gonna be the mentality uh, behind finding the companies that have had breaches. It, it, it's not to pile on to add that 10%, 20% of cost but that everyone else looks at them and says, wow, look what happened to that company. They had this breach, they suffered all these losses, they had a massive fine, they look bad in the press. Uh, you, you mentioned Target Corporation, they were an early uh, a case back when it was, it was a thing and they suffered uh, a lot of losses because people stopped buying from them in the Christmas season. So, I mean, and that we want to be a back channel towards deterrence. I think always think the problem is that you're playing the odds. So a CIO is going to look at the expenditures. Let's say the security person goes to the CEO, the CIO, and says, "Look what happened to Target or somebody else, and uh, we don't want that to happen to us. So we're going to spend we want to spend this kind of money to make us safer." And the CIO looks at him and says, "You know, we didn't spend that money last month, and we were fine." How do you know we're not going to be fine next month? And the answer is you don't. Right? So I, unfortunately, a rational company, I think is going to underspend and take the risk. If they're lucky, their profits go up. If they're unlucky, guy quits again, gets, gets another job and not his problem. So it, it, it is interesting to see that system, which kind of works with robberies and murders, not working in this environment, I think, which leads you again towards that public health model. Yeah, I, I think that's right. I think that when you think about uh, the level of enforcement here, the FTC is our primary regulator of data security rules and they're doing what they can, but they can file what, 12 to 20 complaints a year uh, not all of which are data security related complaints, some are privacy and they've got a lot of other stuff on their plates. And so then it falls to the state attorneys general to sort of do any other follow ups or breach notification laws and breach notification laws. One of the things we talk about is there are reputational penalties associated with having to dispose of breach, but not that many. And people like I, I don't know about you, but. I feel like I'm getting breach notification fatigue. We have so many, like it's just another day. Well, I mean, that was the thing. In, in 2005, you got a breach notification law that mattered and it made right. the press and there was huge reputation. Now when they're coming once a week, nobody right. cares, right? So, so breach notification relies on public shaming, right. which only works if you have that outrage mechanism. Exactly. And so, and we don't, and we also don't have any other way of holding people accountable through, I mean, every now and then, maybe you'll get like a shareholder derivative suit against Yahoo for bad data security practices or, or something like that. Um, but it's very rare. It's, it's few and far between. And so you're right. I think that there is an incredible incentive, not because of lack of, of laws, though that's a lot of the argument that we make in the book, but also we're not enforcing really the, a lot of the laws that we have on the books which is part of this equation. 
Yeah, a bunch of thoughts on on this. I mean, one is too that you know there's you know the not just the the, the amount of penalties, but also the the likelihood of getting caught. So you know people speed all the time because most speeders don't get caught, and and there there just aren't enough regulators to go around to to penalize even a fraction of of the companies that have breaches that are at fault. So you know maybe like ten percent or less get get enforced against. So companies know that hey, there's a good chance we're not going to get caught they're already going to have a lot of uh suffering from the breach so you know adding on a piling on a little bit more it, it's not clear that that additional deterrence is going to make that much of a, a dent in in things in, in what they do target um also is an interesting case because they were spending a lot of money on security they had a lot of uh, stuff going on they 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 did have a good spend um unfortunately they they ignored the warnings that the software was was giving them that they had they 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 didn't utilize what they had very well um but i i don't know if it was a, a money problem um a lot of companies said well yeah we'll, we'll get that same software but that wouldn't have solved it they actually have to you know pay attention to the software to learn from the human mistakes that that happened um but this wasn't like a i think a lack of resources uh, in in the in the target case, I mean the hackers did you know were, were kind of you know somewhat shoddy in in in, in what they did, um, and and it should have been caught. So a lot of things just it's not working on that that deterrence model, and I, I think Bruce put it very well. Like it, it, that model can work in certain cases, but it's just not really working well in security but but that's what the law keeps going to it keeps going to that playbook but you know if the, if that play constantly doesn't work maybe it's time we try a different playbook so why isn't that just a problem of the the, the amount of fine so i think uh this actually works well in smuggling when you go when you go into the u.s right it's unlikely that your bags are searched but if they are searched and they find contraband, it's really, really, really bad. So if you kind of do the math, right, you'll get away with it nine out of 10 times, but the 10th time you get caught isn't worth it. So can I make the fine so large that that will work? And, and does Europe do this better? Right? Europe under GDPR is fining companies in ways that aren't rounding errors to the other costs of the breach. They're finding them in ways that make a difference. I is think that, that works is better. That working? Is that better? Well, I think it works better in privacy than security, because I think ultimately, though, it, it's the organizations that get breached are just one actor at fault. And I think that, you know, just pummeling them more and more and more is still not going uh, to get to, to perfection. And ultimately, the fact is that, you know, companies, you know, would say what the lesson is, you know, don't you know, have anyone have access to information. And, you know, the fact is that we do want some risk here, you know, that to, to data, there are uses of data. And, you know, we do want to balance convenience and, and access and other things. We don't want perfect security. And so the law, you know, can't just keep punishing companies demanding perfection when I think we don't want perfection. If we have the fines too high and too steep and too many, you know, it, it, it puts too much weight on one actor, but there are other folks that are contributing to this problem that are getting a total pass. And, and those actors need to be leaned upon because they're part of the problem. It's like you can't, there's only one piece of the pie that the law is going after, but but the other pieces of the pie, I, I think are are contributing as much, if not more to this problem. So this is interesting. I think it's something your book does very well, that we tend to focus on the proximate cause. It's not just in privacy, right? When something happens in the world, we look for the cause closest to the event, right? The driver of the car, the particular terrorist who pulled the trigger, the thing that happened. And we tend to focus on that at the expense of all the contributory causes that led up to that moment. And what I like about your work, and, and in some way, as uh, Josephine Wolf does also a great job at this in her book, of looking at the entire chain of cause. I noticed uh, you, you thanked her in your acknowledgement. So she did at least read your draft, which is good. So one of the reasons I like your approach is it looks at that whole 
causal chain and not just it's the fault of the person who clicked on the link. It's the fault of uh, the person who pushed the wrong button or did the wrong thing. It's everything. And it, and it could be other companies, other products, other services, other systems that contribute to this ecosystem where the breach took place. Yeah, that's totally right. I think that that when you only look at the one person that's like holding the what the, the breached hot potato, right, that we call it, um, then you tend, you know, you could find them into oblivion, like Dan says, right? Like you could find them $4 billion. And, and, and we've talked about this, and, and, and you know this, that you could also do everything right and still get hacked, right? If, if, if some, you know, someone's got enough time and resources, right, that they're gonna, they're gonna do it. And so instead, let's, you know, optimize fines. And I do think that Europe actually has a better approach to risk, right? So in, in other words, they don't for, they actually presume harm when a breach has occurred so that you don't have to sort of go through the whole like, you know, rigmarole of, of oh, well, here's all the financial receipts of, you know, time that we've lost or anything like that. They're just like, well, of course it's a harm because there's a breach. Um, and so they do do that well, but I think that by, by allocating the risk more broadly, many hands make for a light load. And then you implicitly recognize that you do, you know, what's reasonable for you to do as a company, and you should do it, and we're going to hold you accountable for it. But then after that, you can, right, we're going to, we're going to require things of other people, because otherwise, like Dan says, we could have a rule that says you should have perfect security. And then if you get breached, you have to pay $7 billion. But that's going to, you know, result in a, this weird sort of incentive where the only thing to keep data safe is to throw it in a wood chipper. Um, and we want to, you know, we still want to be able to use, you know, data in sort of limited instances. And so what I think we're trying to do is, is find a better, is have a conversation about a better way to balance those values so that we spread the accountability around a little more and still keep things useful while making them safer than they currently are anyway. So something else uh, that's come up, it's in, it's in your book and it's also came up here is notion of, of security by design. And, uh, you know, funny, I think of Canada as the first country to really embrace security by design as a principle out of their, 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 their put in their privacy laws. Any chance of, I mean, where do you see that happening? I mean, I can see governments doing it. I can see the insurance industry. I mean, one of the things that can flow backwards from either liabilities or regulation is you'd insure against losses and the insurance industry might push some design principles like they do with electrical safety. Are we right? Are yeah, we I mean, I think that's great. So I think there's two questions in there. Uh, the first is where are we likely to see this? I think that the lowest hanging fruits that we could see on some of this is for the Federal Trade Commission to engage in a rulemaking proceeding around data security specifically and make security by design one of the major aspects of their rulemaking. Um, I think that would allow for, and e we've seen that it's easier when the FTC has specific rules rather than relying upon unfair and deceptive trade practices sort of generally, they have to sort of build a case for that. Um, when they have specific rules that say, uh, you know, you can't do X with respect to design, you have to do Y, um, you know, a lot of it probably would end up looking a little bit like the uh, Graham Leach Bliley safeguards rules, maybe some more stuff about mandating encryption. And, and like, there's a lot of stuff that you could do that would be really helpful. And the FTC could do that starting now, assuming we don't get any major privacy movement at the federal level over the next couple of years. Um, now, in terms of what the role that insurance plays in this, I think that's a really good question. And I'll just take this opportunity to plug Josephine's next project, which is actually about insurance and data security. Great so book. I'm, I read it draft too. Yeah, I'm going, to, I'm going to defer a lot onto that. But I will say, having conversations with a lot of uh, attorneys and people that work in the insurance, the cybersecurity insurance area. I think it's a really hard problem because cybersecurity insurance is not like health insurance because A, we don't have really good sort of actuary tables. Like there's no version of an actuary table for cybersecurity. So it's hard to set 
rates appropriately to make sure that you're sort of balancing things. B, you've got the difficult problem of having the harm not be located on your body. Like, so when I get developed some sort of malady, it's relatively clear, you know, when it happens and how it happens. And like, you know, there are causal effects that we can attribute somewhat. Um, that's a lot harder in the insurance. Um, and we have the whole like, you know, nation state carve out thing that really complicates things as well. So there's just a lot of complicating factors because I think that if insurance were in fact workable, you could turn to tort law as a much more reliable, generally a much more reliable way to remedy that because insurance and tort law sort of works you know, they, they figure that out in other areas. And so maybe it would be a little more effective. I don't know, Dan, if you have any other. Yeah. Well, I think part of the other problem too is, you know, that, you know, the insurance will work if the security is within the full control of the insurer. So, you know, if a company is insured, you can say, okay, you should do training, you should do, you know, pen testing, you should do these different things. And they can do them and the insurance can drive them to do it. But a lot of the security problems are not fully in the control of a, of, of a company. It might be that, you know, someone's using a insecure device and, you know, the device maker is not the insurer. They're not insuring. They just put out the device and the market doesn't really account for security very well you know someone buying the device is going to buy it because it's cool and it's cheap um and, and i think th this is something bruce uh wrote i think really effectively in 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 the click here to kill everybody book you know that we have these devices they're they're not very secure and the market really you know people can't evaluate that very well uh, and the market really doesn't account for it and 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 the makers of them are not if you don't hold them accountable um, why would they get insurance? They're, they're not, they get a free pass. They can make these, you know, you know, crappy insecure devices and th their incentives are just to compete on price and coolness. So unless we incentivize them to take security more seriously, they're not going to do it. And, and so the insurance is not really touching that. I think the law has to say you're accountable. Once the law holds the right people accountable and is going to make them at risk of losing money, then the insurance kicks in. Then they'll say, okay, maybe we need to insure against the harms that we would cause by these products. And then the insurance uh, can do its thing and start saying, well, you know, if you want to be insured, we're going to require these things. But it starts well, with the law right, making so account things, people accountable. Yeah, I think that's right. That insurance follows uh, responsibility. So there's a question in the uh, in the Q&A that asked about uh, liabilities and is software liability something that would work here? I tend to think liability is part of the solution for exactly what, what Dan said, that once you have liability, you, ha you set up an incentive structure, which includes insurance, which includes proactive measures, which includes a lot of things. It, right, insurance basically turns a variable risk into a fixed cost. That's all it does. But companies like fixed costs, so they can budget against them. So, I mean, is is this is is the questioner asked, and I'll ask you: Is an insurance mechanism uh, a good thing to do to think about? Yeah, here? yeah, I think I think it's a great mechanism because you know we do want you know companies can process a fixed cost much better than than an uncertain variable cost. But it it's sort of there there is that I think as you said a prerequisite for you know, the insurance to really function in the way it, it should is you have to have the responsibility. And I think that the law needs to, you know, if it holds the right people responsible in the right way, I think then everything can, can follow and the system works. If it's not holding the right people responsible, if it's, I think what it does is over punishes the, uh, the, the, the companies that suffer the breach, uh, and under punishes the other actors. If if the responsibility is not rightly allocated, then the system's not going to work, and the the other irresponsible actors are never going to be responsible. And and the insurance and no one and nothing else is going to make them responsible. The law right, has so what to. What software liabilities? Tell me about that. Software liabilities. Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. totally part of this problem. I was actually yeah. just. I, I mean, I, I think that that. For a mix of different reasons, the law has been reluctant to hold software developers liable in tort law for this in the same way that we hold people liable when they make defective products. So if you make a, a 
a power tool that injures someone, right? That's defective and injures someone. You can sue them uh, in tort law and you don't face some of these incredible barriers, but for a, a lot of different reasons, including the fact that software tends to get categorized differently than goods in the Uniform Commercial Code. And there's a lot of deference to boilerplate transaction law. And, and there's a really good article on this called The Internet of Torts by Rebecca Krutoff that gets into all the various reasons why the law has, has failed to really hold software developers liable in the same way as, as makers of physical goods. And I think one of the arguments that Dan and I make in the book is that we need to change that to, to change the story. Um, otherwise, it's going to you're going to continue to be able to sort of waive liability with an I agree button for this service, um, which allows companies to essentially evade accountability. All right. So there's one question I think is really interesting. Someone mentioned that uh, when we think about what might happen to privacy law in the Supreme Court, with the uh, reproductive rights ruling that's coming. How is that gonna change everything? And boy, I have no idea. So I'm curious what you think. Well, I mean, it's, it, it, it's unclear what, what the implications are and how far the, the, the court's gonna go with it. And I think a lot of it is, you know, how far does the court go with it in the future? Does it use it? There's a, a constitutional right to information privacy. Does that, the opinion undermine that? Does it undermine, you know, does it go and, and undermine the very foundations of Roe, which are in a case about contraceptives, Griswold versus Connecticut, about you know freedom to you know for a married couple to use contraceptives is that going to be threatened and i think a lot of it really it's hard to, to say just kind of how far the the court's gonna go i think what's also unprecedented is i can't think of an instance where the supreme court has uh overruled a decision that has granted rights uh, that we we've typically it's been thus far a kind of a, a, a mostly a one way ratchet to get more rights uh, and not fewer. Uh, so this is really going to be interesting. Uh, we're in a new era where you know we might you know see you know fewer rights uh, in 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 the future or at least the rights changing. It seems that you know companies have. Uh, a lot more rights than than people do the, these days. You know, they they can yeah. do whatever they want, and you know now you know the the spending of money is is speech these days. Uh, you know, I always think if you really want rights as a person it, with our Supreme Court, you should incorporate yourself. Uh, so th that that's a big problem, and I don't know where it's going. Um, and it's hard to know where it's going because I I don't the logic of a lot of these decisions doesn't make a lot of sense to me. So I, I struggle even understanding, well, how can I predict what the court's going to do in the future if, if I really don't understand the, the logic of how it's departing from what it's done in the past? So it, 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 it throws open a lot of uncertainty and doubt in the entire trajectory of you know, where the Supreme Court and rights are going. Yeah, and, and I'll just add, there, there are three sort of things that, that we can, I think, think about with respect to the impending demise of, of, of Roe, one of which is it really underscores the need for a strong, robust, holistic statutory framework for uh, privacy and data security, including, including sort of anti-surveillance rules, data privacy rules, data security rules, the whole thing. Um, I Like Dan, I'm, I don't know exactly what's going to happen directly related to the constitutional right to information privacy, uh, because the, the case that that was based on, which is Waylon Bureau, I, I teach it to my students, is it's a little bit like Schrodinger's cat of privacy, which is the Supreme Court has recognized that it exists like two or three times, but it, it's never actually seen it. Um, it, it. It's never been vindicated in any one particular way. So, so I don't worry about that as much, but here's what I do worry about with this particular court, which is they have signaled a relatively heavy hand on recognizing, and this is what Dana is talking about, corporate free speech rights. Um, and so what I worry about is that any good data security and data privacy rules, particularly those that incorporate strong uh, data minimization rules, data collection principles, uh, and limitations on reuse of information, I, I worry about whether that will get struck down under 
under the Supreme Court as a violation of the, of the First Amendment, um, because that's the sort of thing that I view as a, as a major potential roadblock to meaningful laws. And there's a larger principle sort of implicated too, and that, you know, on the surface, you know, you know, Roe is, is not about data privacy, but in a deeper level it is because data privacy is to some extent a means to an end. It's about protecting people's freedom. It's about protecting people's ability to make decisions about their lives, to make accurate calculations about the costs and benefits of those decisions, about not being ma manipulated and coerced and controlled in their decisions. It's really an aspect of freedom and it's, it's a means to help achieve that freedom. And so if the law essentially, if states can, can deny people the freedom to make those decisions, then, you know, you know, protecting privacy, you know, becomes somewhat moot if, if people can't even make decisions. The privacy is about helping people make these decisions freely about themselves. Uh, and it then protects people in doing so. Uh, so we need to protect the right to make those decisions, as well as privacy, which enhances the ability to make decisions about oneself without fear of reprisal or you know, surveillance, uh, inhibiting those decisions and chilling those decisions. I think of it in terms of three things, information, choice, and agency, and that that's what we need. So actually, I want to turn back to Europe. So, right, if you think about it, the car I buy in the US is not the same car I buy in Mexico because auto manufacturers tune the engines to environmental laws. But the Facebook I get in the US is exactly the same Facebook I get everywhere else because for Facebook, for lots of these companies, it's just easier to, uh, to do it one way. So we in the US benefit from the European GDPR, from the California privacy law, even if we don't live in California or Europe, because these companies com comply with the law and then push it out worldwide. Now, I remember working for IBM at the time and IBM saying, we're gonna implement GDPR worldwide because that is easier than figuring out who a European is. So even if the US is a mess because we can't pass good laws, the FTC is sort of strangling their authority, Supreme Court's gonna gut our privacy, can Europe or can a sufficiently large market somewhere else on the planet, maybe the EU is the only one, can they solve our problems? I don't know if they can solve it, but they can certainly help it. And I think the phenomenon you point to is, is absolutely the, the case where you know, the, the, the GDPR has pushed things forward. The EU has long, even before the GDPR has been pushing the law forward. Uh, and and the, it's interesting how the ball, the needle has moved much more in that direction. If, if you think about when the first conversation of a comprehensive privacy law first came up, uh, which was in the early 2000s. Uh, and at that point, industry was totally against it. Hardly any company was for it, except for like one or two. Uh, and uh, what was on the table was a much more minimalist compared to what's on the table now. When you look at most of the proposals, um, even a, a proposal by the Chamber of Commerce, what they have in the proposal is much more advanced than what would have been in 2000. Now laws are having a right to deletion without batting an eyelash, having data portability without batting an eyelash, um, a lot, having the definition of privacy in the GDPR without, you know, without controversy, and 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 things that that you know were, were seen as just. Um, Sort of un-American, and there's no way this could possibly fly in America. You know, now are almost you know not controversial in the law, and and even both sides, uh, you know, are are fine with it. So I think the we really have they really have succeeded in driving the regulatory conversation um, in, in in a pretty profound way. And, and I'll just add, Bruce, that, that I do think that the, both the GDPR, but also thinking about the forthcoming Digital Services Act and the Data Governance Act and a lot of the, the legislation that's sort of in the works there does a really good job of taking design seriously. So Article 25 of the GDPR requires data protection by design and by default. And that's, that's a, a, I think, a really great pattern to sort of latch on to what Dan said about 
uh, thinking about how lawmakers might in the United States both be influenced by uh, uh, those rules, but then also how tech companies can sort of get adjusted to it over time and say, all right, fine, we're, you know, we have to do this for Europe anyway, we might as well do it for everyone. So the questioner asks uh, really about the precautionary principle. Now we've traditionally, I mean, tech moves faster than law, we know that, and law has struggled to, to, to keep up. And generally, at least in the US, if it's not explicitly prohibited, it's allowed. You know, are we going to move to a regime where, if it's not explicitly allowed, it's prohibited? You know, flipping that on its head. But I think of that as a precautionary principle. When, when something is, or think about uh, pharmaceuticals, right? it's not that if it's not prohibited, you can do it. It has to be explicitly for approved. So that's pharmaceuticals, that's airplane design. That's like stuff, if you get it wrong, that can kill you. Software so far hasn't been there, but it's getting there. It's in cars, it's in hospitals. Are we gonna move towards a more European style, a more uh, prohibited unless explicitly for approved regulatory regime? Well, I actually think the GDPR gets a bad rap for this because uh, yes and, and no, I would say, because I think that there is a one of the law, the GDPR does work where you, unlike the US law, where you can use information as you want, um, uh, unless you cause a harm, uh, and you can provide notice and do whatever you want. The GDPR has six lawful bases to process data. Now, it's interesting that the last lawful basis is legitimate interests of the controller or a third party, so long as they don't outweigh the potential harms that could cause to people, people's rights or interests. So it's a balancing. And it's a pretty broad catch-all that a lot of companies use. In fact, I think most companies use that as their lawful basis. It requires them to at least have a justification for why the use is, 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 is legitimate, which is a pretty open-ended justice. So it's not like very, it's not, when you think about it, it's not that restrictive. And the rule that, hey, your use can't be, you know, less than the, the harms that it causes to others, you know, is, is a good test. Uh, so I, I think that it, I don't think that gives such a small playground by which to use the data. It gives a pretty broad playground, right? You, you can do a lot under that justification without um, being too restricted. And, and I think the rules of restriction there, well, if it's not a legitimate use or it's harmful to somebody, are good rules. So I, I'm not sure that that is you know, so stifling to innovation uh, that, you know, firms are going to be, you know, so restricted that they can't do good things with, with information. Yeah, and I, I completely agree. I mean, there's, it's not as though it's a binary thing where you either go full precautionary principle, and, and even as Dan said, I think that the requirement to have a legitimate basis for processing data is a good one, and I would support it in the U.S., um, but you could also think about it in tiers. So the AI Act that's being proposed in the EU now targets high risk AI, right? And so that's would have a, a sort of higher level of scrutiny associated with it than maybe sort of normal uh, AI. Or some of the, the proposals that have been put out there are to professionalize uh, software engineering. Uh, the idea is to make this something that that uh, when you engage in, you're engaging in a very serious act that has consequences for people's lives. It requires training. It requires forethought and balancing of ethics and all sorts of things. Um, and maybe we should bring that in. And that would be a way to, to have sort of a precautionary principle and that it would require a sort of licensure to licensing to do. And all of that recognizes that the creation of data is a moral act because it has implications on people's lives. And I think that our law has been relatively blasé about that up until this point and should take it more seriously. So we're about at reaching the end. I'm going to ask you to sum up in a, in a second. I want to pull one loose end that I've written on my notes that came up or I don't even earlier sometime. I worry about overly pers pers prescriptive rules, tech rules. Right? Tech moves fast. And we find that if we write a rule to the tech, three years come by and the tech is different in a way that subverts the rule. And it's, it's easy and any, uh, a, my, a good example is the Storage Communications Act. Back when it was passed, uh, storage was expensive. You got your email down on your computer and that's how you read it. 
and any email left on the server for more than three months was abandoned. Now it's Gmail and all of our emails left on the server all the time. So we have a law written for a moment in tech that does the exact opposite of what it was intended. And now we can't get rid of it. So that's my last use then. Uh, if you would, i like you each to, to sum up. I'm going to hold up your book because you people didn't. It's, a, I think it's a great read. So thank you for writing it. And uh, yeah, tell us something exciting. Yeah, well, I, I'll say amen to what you've uh, said. I'm actually working on a book on privacy and technology. And, and, and a point I'm making in the book is- You're supposed to take a break between books. It's hard to. Uh, I know. But it, it's- it basically, a point is, you know, to, you, the law needs to focus uh, less on what technology does, uh, less on how technology works and more on what it does. It needs to focus more on the values we want to do. It needs to be a lot more open-ended and flexible because technology does change. And so if you write a law that's really tethered to a very particular uh, technology at a particular point in time, the law is going to be obsolete. If you write a law in, in a way that that uh, is more open-ended to the development of technology, it's going to work a lot better. And an example of, of, of a law that, that's better in that regard is the, the VIPA, the Video Privacy Protection Act. Though it uses a very narrow term like videotape rentals, um, it, it actually defines the term in a broad way that allowed it to grow and develop with other forms of uh, videos such as streaming and DVD. So it defined it in a broad way, which uh, you know uh, led it to not have the problems of the Stored Communications Act. So there are better and worse ways to draft laws here, uh, and I think that you know drafting laws really an art, uh, and it really takes some careful thought uh, because there's so many ways to mess it up uh, and to get it wrong. Uh, and I think that you know policymakers really need to. To, to, to get uh, a lot better at their game here. Um, I, I, we're living in a golden age of, of regulation these days. The, the legislatures are really interested in this. We're seeing new laws passed in states and around the world. I think what is disappointing to me is that I see these as a lot of lost opportunities. When I read some of the laws, I, I cringe because I just see, okay, you know, this approach has long been discredited. This approach has been tried and failed. And they're just copying something from another law. And they're not really thinking thoughtfully about what could be done. And there's a lot of really good ideas out there um, that really can work. Uh, and I hope that, you know, more attention is paid to those ideas by legislatures as they start crafting their laws, uh, rather than just, uh, you know, kind of dusting off a copy of, you know, California's privacy law, and then, you know, kind of weakening it a little bit and watering it down a little bit and passing it, uh, which is unfortunately what I see going on right now. That's Georgia, right. All right, Woody, what do you got? And I'll just end by just by saying that the thing that Dan and I really saw when we dug into a lot of the laws here is that there's a tendency to treat data security as sort of a, its own discrete little thing. Uh, and I get the tendency why I develop sort of in a silo on its own. And uh, but one of the things that that I just would want to leave us all with is that we've seen that data security is about privacy and it's about safety and it's about a lot of other things that you also I think do a really good job explaining in the book. And so um, I, it, let's actually use, uh, in my opinion, the the palatability of data security. It's something that actually everybody seems to agree on. Like, do you want to be secure or insecure? Everyone's going to say, I want to be secure. And we can actually use that sort of political capital, I think, to motivate a lot of different structural regimes like privacy, anti-surveillance rules, and the like. Um, and so those things are all related more than I think lawmakers have recognized. And I'd encourage us to think about them um, as overlapping rather than discrete areas. Yeah, I want this to become a campaign issue. Like we've never seen this question come up in a presidential debate. We've never, it's, it's just not a campaign issue, which means the lobbyists win. Yeah. All right, so this has been actually a lot of fun. Uh, thanks for having me on. I'm publishing a book in January, so you should, we should all come back and we can talk about that because this has been great. So, so what is it? What's you, the book uh, in thank January? audience for uh, the questions and uh, I guess go home. Uh, you are all home. Do whatever you do. <laughs> thanks, Bruce. Thank you.